When I work with ChatGPT beginners, I always come back to the same seven tips, not because they're advanced, just because they have the most immediate impact on productivity. The first one alone saves hours per week, and most people don't even know it exists. So let's jump in. Okay, so with our tips for ChatGPT, we're focusing on maximum impact, minimum effort. And the way I talk through these, I'm gonna talk about the problem that many beginners run into and the solution slash tip that I provide to people for that problem. And the first problem is prompt engineering. So a lot of people get overwhelmed by all the different techniques that you can leverage to get the most out of AI. And this can truly be a steep learning curve. But the good thing is we can outsource prompting to AI. There are different ways we can have AI prompt for us to get better prompts from what we've written. And the first tip I always give to anybody that's starting out is after you've established what you want, so be clear on your ask, once you've been clear on your ask, then you can use a prompt optimizer to basically inject all the best practices of prompting GPT-5 without having to know any of those best practices. OpenAI will do it for you. And I'm gonna show you an example of what this looks like. So here in this document, I have a starter prompt. So it's a very, very basic prompt. It's just two sentences. I've simply stated, rewrite my emails with the goal of simplifying them further. So they're written at a fifth grade reading level. Use simple sentences. It's okay to restructure to improve understanding, but don't remove any critical points. That's it. This is not a sophisticated prompt, it's just two sentences. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the prompt optimizer, which I'll show you how to get to in a second. And I'm gonna say optimize. So I've pasted in the text. I'm gonna select optimize down here. And this is automatically going to inject all the best practices for GPT-5 specifically into my prompt so I can get the most out of that model. Now, why this loads, I'll show you how to get to this. So there's two ways you can get to this. The first way is the first way you wanna get there is the platform. So you go to platform.openai.com. And this platform is dedicated to developers. But the good thing about this is you can get the benefits from this platform as a day-to-day -day user and not a developer. So a quick side note is you will have to add maybe 3 to $5 of API credits on here to use it. But those 3 to $5 will last you probably six to eight months because it's so ridiculously cheap to use this optimizer. So once you've gone to this URL, you can either optimize directly here. So to see this developer message box, you would paste in the same prompt here. Once you've pasted that prompt, you can go to the optimize button here and select optimize, and it's going to do the same exact thing that this is doing right now. And then the other way of getting to this, if I go to the new tab, if you go to this URL here, which is quite long, so I'd recommend just going to the platform one first, and then you can save this one later on, and I'll include both in the YouTube description. All right, and so when I come back here, you can see automatically it's injected a ton of new prompt information into the prompt I gave it, and it's a lot longer. So I gave it two sentences, and it gave me almost a page back. You'll also notice there's a series of hashtags. So all these hashtags here are acting as delimiters for the AI. So it's letting the AI know that each segment is separated. So this is the checklist section. This is the output format section, et cetera, et cetera. That lets the AI know, the AI know where to look when. And there's tons of other best practices incorporated in here. But the good thing is, is you don't necessarily need to know those. You just have to know how to use the tool, when to use it. And that was our first tip. So our second problem and second tip is typing as a bottleneck. So oftentimes with AI, it's important to give as much context as possible to get the best quality out of it. But when we type, we're always actively editing what we're writing. And also it's very hard to communicate certain pieces of information via our fingers because it is taxing, it's friction filled, it's harder to do. So instead of always typing, I highly recommend as a second tip is to talk, not type. And what I mean by this is using dictation. So dictation is a feature baked into ChatGPT. So if I go to ChatGPT here, you'll see in the chat box, there's a little microphone here. And when I select this and I talk, everything that I'm saying right now is being converted to speech into text. So after I'm finished, I can select the check mark. It's then gonna convert that and I then can send that off to the AI. This is probably one of the most overlooked features, but it's a tip that if you embraced it and you get past where the awkward phase, because it is quite cringe when you're talking to your laptop and you're trying to communicate verbally, in a text-oriented way, it can be hard. So don't try to talk as you type, just talk like you're talking to a person, give it as much context that's needed for the specific task or ask you're giving it. And my bet is that it'll give you better outputs when you speak instead of type. Quick pause in your regular programming. This video is brought to you by me. So two things. First off, Blow is a 30-day AI insight series, completely free. You'll get 30 insights in your inbox how you can apply AI to your business and your work. And the second thing is if you'd like to work with me, Blow are a series of offerings to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. With that being said, let's get back into the video. And now on to our third problem slash tip. So the tip here is improving accuracy. And a common thing that I hear from a lot of different beginners is that they complain about the AI hallucinating, stating that it's given it the wrong sources or it created a bunch of facts that weren't true. And there are many ways you can reduce hallucinations, but there are two primary ways I wanna show you with this tip that's very straightforward and easy to do. So the first one here is going to be simply enabling web search. 
Within ChatGPT, there's the, the ability to turn on web search, which then ensures that anything, any fact that it gets back to you is going to have a citation associated. So you can check the citation against the fact that it gave you to ensure that it's accurate. And I'll show you how to do this. So if we go to ChatGPT, I'm gonna clear out this text. If I go to the plus sign here, under more, there's a button right here that says web search. When I turn that on, anytime that I ask the AI to then research something for me, it's going to use this feature to research the web and come back with a series of citations so I can validate ensuring that the sources are accurate. So that's one way to improve hallucinations or reduce them. The other way is a grounding tactic. So maybe you don't necessarily want the AI to research on something, but you've given it a massive document. So maybe it's a 50 or 100 page document and you want it to answer questions in relation to that document. But sometimes it may go off into the web and search and try to find answers to that question, not looking at the document. Or maybe it makes up different facts from its head and not looking at the document. So those are issues that people run into and complain about. And there's a very simple way we can mitigate this. And it's a concept called grounding. And what I've given you here is a simple example prompt of what grounding looks like. So in this prompt, I'm being very explicit. I'm saying, I only want you to provide answers from the document provided. Do not, all caps, pull anything from the internet or from your general knowledge base. By doing this, I'm grounding the AI into the document that I provided, ensuring that it's giving me answers back from that. And these are just two simple ways of reducing the chances of hallucinations occurring. Now let's move on to the next problem, which is using the wrong tool for the wrong task. So a lot of people, when they use ChatGPT, their hope is to automate and augment different types of repetitive tasks that they have. And it's very, very good at that. But oftentimes people forget to use a specific feature called projects, which is dedicated to this. And projects, these are a way to basically bottle up all of the specific repetitive tasks that you have and have a hyper tailored AI to that given task. So for example, say that I have a specific meeting on a reoccurring basis. And after that meeting, I always have to write the same email in a similar way. Well, I can take this project inside of ChatGPT and I can have it be my email writer for that specific meeting. So when I'm finished with a meeting, I can drop in the transcript from the meeting. It automatically drafts the email as I would. And I then can copy and paste and send it, saving me probably 20 to 30 minutes after every single meeting. Another thing I wanna share about projects is all of the experts that I know heavily rely on projects and not necessarily the general ChatGPT. Me personally, I have 64 projects inside of ChatGPT, 22 of which I use on a weekly basis. And as I mentioned, 75 to 80% of the time of the experts that I know that use ChatGPT spend all of their time inside of projects because they have tailored AI for their use cases. Now, what is a project? How do I find it? How do I set it up? So if we go to ChatGPT here, I'm gonna turn the search off. We're gonna open up the side window and down here, you can see there's a section called projects. Now under projects, these are a series of folders and each folder is a project. So if I wanna create a new project, I do new project here and I'll just type in test. So I'll do create project. And after I've done that, you can see there's a few things I wanna call out here. So we have add files and we have system instructions. So if I go to the three dots here, we have add instructions and this is where all of the magic happens. We need to ensure that we have very specific system instructions in the background. So the AI looks at this first before it talks to me. And in that email example, it's going to look at these system instructions and it's gonna see that I have a very specific structure for my emails. I have a certain time, type of tone that I like to write in. And the AI knows that I'm going to give it a transcript from the meeting, so that should then initiate it writing the email. So it's simply priming the AI before I ever get to it. That's our system instructions. And you could also add files as well. So maybe there's specific files that the AI should reference before it ever does anything for you. So that is again, a critical tip that a lot of people overlook that can get you a lot more productivity by simply using it effectively. Our next problem slash tip is lacking the ability to be AI first when it comes to your mindset. The primary problem here is that a lot of people will subscribe to ChatGPT and they buy it and they're ready to use it but they don't make it a part of their daily habitual routine. And there's a really important concept here that I wanna get across to you, which is AI intuition or AI in first mindset. And the only way this is built is through experience and exposure to AI, which means that ChatGPT needs to always be visible and readily available for you to use. And a simple tip here is all you have to do is make sure that ChatGPT is open and easily accessible. So if you have multiple monitors, have ChatGPT open on one monitor at all times. Or if you don't, simply just have a tab open like I do here with ChatGPT readily available. And anytime you have a task or a question, you should immediately default to seeing if ChatGPT can either completely or partially automate that process. And this is the daily practice that eventually builds AI intuition. And as your AI intuition grows, it gives you the ability to know what problems are suitable for AI, at least today, and which ones are too complex for AI to achieve right now. And that's what's going to separate the haves and the have nots in the world of AI. And let's go on to our next problem slash tip, which is uh, writing with AI. 
So oftentimes people use AI to write things, which is totally useful. And I completely agree and you should do that. But they use it in a limited way. Instead of having AI use Canvas, which is a dedicated feature to assist you with writing long form pieces, such as emails, reports, etc., they usually have AI write something in a basic thread. So if I'm just inside of ChatGPT without using Canvas, and by doing this, if you have a long form piece written by AI, and maybe there's a certain paragraph you want it to rewrite, if you ask it to do that, it's going to rewrite the entire thing, not just that piece. So you have to then double check and make sure that it didn't write, rewrite anything else when making that edit. That's one issue. The second issue is when you have AI rewrite an entire piece over and over in the same thread, you're wasting a lot of tokens, which is basically memory space for the AI, and its intelligence starts to degrade. And there's a chance that it may make more mistakes by doing that. So instead, you should use the Canvas feature. The Canvas feature is a way for you to collaborate with AI and have it rewrite things in a targeted fashion. Let me show you an example. So if I go to ChatGPT, and we're inside of ChatGPT here in a regular conversation, I'm going to go to the plus sign, I'm going to go to more, and I'm going to go to Canvas. Once I've turned this on, you can see this blue light thing. This blue light pops up. This is Canvas. I'm going to have it write something simple for me. All right. So I've asked it to write a simple one pager on the concept of entropy in the universe. So you can see immediately as it's writing this, there's this black box around it. And this is initiating Canvas. You can see that Canvas has been initiated by that signifier of this black box. So now that it finished, I'm going to go to edit. So when I select edit, it's going to move this to the right hand side. So now you can see on the right hand side, I have somewhat of a like Google Doc experience on the right hand side because I can highlight things, which means I can bold them, I can italicize, etc. I can change text in here as well. So if I want to add something here, say um, dogs, I can add text. I can delete text, I can do things like that. But the useful thing here is instead of just having that, I can have AI make edits for me. So here I can highlight this. I can say ash chat to BT, and I'm going to use dictation to be faster. Can you please make this shorter? Hit enter. And what's going to happen is the AI is going to only edit this specific sentence that I highlighted. And by doing this, I know that it only changed this. So you can see that it rewrote that sentence and made it shorter. And this is the importance of Canvas. There's a lot of other things you can do with Canvas for right now. Just this is the primary tip I want to share with you as a beginner to use it for writing. And our final problem slash tip is there's a lot of dead time in our days, usually around commutes and other types of things. And we can still use AI in those moments. And the best way to use this is via the mobile app. So if you download the mobile app on your phone, you can set up Bluetooth. And while you're on a walk in the car, you can talk to AI and it will talk back to you. And here are just three use cases that I've recommended and I've seen other people get a lot of leverage from. So if you're commuting back and forth from work via the car or somewhere else, you can talk to AI, have it research things for you and have a conversation. Another one is maybe you're brainstorming or trying to figure out a problem associated to your business or work. You can then go on a walk, talk to AI in the midst of that and help it think through something for you. And then another example I've seen a lot of people get benefit from is practicing their sales and pitches. So maybe you're selling something to a certain persona. You're selling to a skeptical CFO and you want to figure out a way to craft your pitch to persuade them. You can have AI take on a persona, take on that CFO persona, and you can pitch it live. And to quickly show you what advanced voice mode looks like, if I go back into ChatGPT, I'll start a new conversation. You can see on the right hand side, there's these sound waves. If I click that, it's going to turn on voice mode and AI is going to talk back and forth with me. Again, you should do this on your mobile app. I just wanted to show you what it looks like on the computer so you can find it on your phone. And those are our tips. So as a quick recap, first, Use AI to assist with the prompting process. Second, talk, don't type. It's higher bandwidth between you and the AI. Third, the way to reduce hallucinations is using web search and grounding the AI on the document you've given it. Four, use projects and use them consistently because you can have the AI hyper-tailored to a given task you care about. Fifth, you need to have a habit of using AI so you can have an AI-first mindset, building AI intuition over time, knowing how to match up a problem with the AI. After that, you should use Canvas as much as possible when you're writing so you have it doing targeted rewrites, not rewriting the entire piece for you. And finally, we have voice mode. So you should use this when you're on the move, on a commute, on a walk, or whatever else, to talk back and forth with AI to have it research and brainstorm things with you. And that's it. So if you enjoyed this, please reshare it with your friends. And as a reminder, two things. First off, below is a free link to a 30-day AI insight series. Completely free, you'll get 30 insights in your inbox for how you can apply AI to your business and your work. And the second thing is if you'd like to work with me, blow a series of offerings to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. And with that being said, you should totally check out this next video that YouTube thinks that you're going to love. See you next time, Internet.